When I was invited to the Military History Museum in Dresden in 2019, I also had the chance to take some nice footage of the IS-2. Sadly, this tank is barely covered in English. Luckily, the museum's curator Jens Wehner reads Russian and does help with some Russian literature and will provide further commentary. Although we are not 100% sure if we got everything right. The origin of the IS-2 was influenced in various ways by two heavy tanks, the Soviet KV-1 and the German Tiger. First the KV-1. This was the main heavy tank for the Soviet Union in 1941 to 1943. Yet it had various shortcomings. By autumn of 1942, the KV-1 heavy tanks were widely regarded in the Red Army and the Soviet government as a failed design. During assessment of the disastrous combat failures in the Kharkov battles and the Crimean campaign in the summer of 1942, the KV tank was roundly criticized for its technical and tactical shortcomings. The KV-1 was rather slow and unreliable, yet used a gun that had a similar performance as that of the T-34, which was more reliable and mobile. Additionally, once the Tiger and later the Panther tanks appeared, it was both outgunned and outarmored. Modernizing the KV-1 failed. The less armored yet faster and more reliable KV-1S was just a stopgap. Second, the capture and study of two Tigers near Leningrad in January 1943. Jens Wiener notes about the early development. The design of the Soviet heavy tanks came from the engineer Josef Kotin. Kotin was since 1937 the head of the development in the Kirov works in Leningrad and from 1941 he was the head of development at the Chelyabinsk tractor factory. There he was the chief designer of the Soviet heavy tanks such as the KV series and the IS series. After the first battles in 1941, it turned out the KV-1 was too slow and had only the same armament as the T-34. The KV-2 was also too slow and already out of production in summer 41. So Kotin and his colleagues tried to develop the KV series further. For that day had an improved tank design called KV-13. At the same time, Codin's team developed a new Howitzer KV. On 24 February 1943, the People's Commissariat of Tank Production ordered two prototypes of heavy tanks. They were named IS tanks. IS meant Joseph Stalin, the Soviet dictator. Maybe his name was chosen to honor Stalin. One IS should have a 76 mm gun, the other a 122 mm Auritzer. It is important to point out here that that was a 120 mm Auritzer, so something similar to the KV-2, hence relatively short belt and with a low muscle velocity, not the 120 mm cannon of the serious production IS-2 with a longer belt and a higher muscle velocity. Both projected tanks should have a weight below 40 metric tons with an armor of 120 mm at the thickest point combined with a strong engine performance of 600 horsepower and 55 km per hour top speed. The IS tank was tested in spring 1943, but in January 1943 the Soviet captured two German Tigers and recognized the danger by this new German tank. So it was decided to give the new IS tank a higher firepower by installing an 85 mm gun with it. This had a major impact on the design. Two guns, 85 mm guns, were tested and both needed a bigger turret. Together with other changes, the weight increased by roughly 5 tons. This led to the IS-1, which had an 85 mm gun. Thus it was also called IS-85. Yet there were two issues with the 85mm gun. First its performance. Several captured German Tiger I tanks were shipped to Chelyabinsk, where they were subjected to 85mm fire from various angles. The 85mm gun could not reliably penetrate the Tiger I, except at the ranges within the lethal envelope of the Tiger's one own 88mm gun. Second, since the T-34 was slated to be upgraded with the 85mm gun as well, the situation would have been that the heavy tank would have the same gun as the medium tank as had previously been the case 
with the T-34 and KB-1. So there was a need for a bigger gun. This led to the adaptation of the A-19 122mm core gun, which was modified for the use within a tank and named D-25. Later on there were initiatives to replace the D-25 with the 100mm D-10 gun, but this never happened. Both guns had their pros and cons. As a Soviet report from April 1944 noted, the rate of fire of the 100mm D10 gun is up to three times higher than that of the 122mm D25 gun, which is a significant advantage of the D10 gun. The 100mm D10 gun presently has an insufficiently robust armor piercing shell, which does not guarantee a reliable penetration of the Panther's armor at a range of over 1200 meters. About the 120mm gun it was stated, the 120mm D25 gun reliably penetrates the front arm of the Panther tank from a range of over 2000 meters. The armor piercing shell of this gun is sufficiently robust and the high explosive granite has a sufficient explosion and fragmentation effect. Until the ammunition and components of the D10 gun are perfected, the 120mm D25 gun must remain as the main armament of the IS tank. Another benefit of the 120mm gun was that there was a complete supply network for ammunition already in working order as well. Yet there was even more to it. A lot of people think about tank versus tank combat. Yet that was often not the usual scenario and or the intended role of some tanks. For the IS-2 this is rather obvious. If one looks at the regular armor loadout, which was 20 shots of high explosive ammo and only 8 shots of armor piercing ammo. Yet back to the development and the firing trials, Jens Wehner will outline these. In July 1943, the Soviet experienced for the first time the German Panther, which was seen as a heavier armored tank. So the development of the A-19 artillery cannon into a 122mm gun received a push. In September 1943, the IS tank and the gun were merged. This new tank was called Object 214. Implementing the huge cannon into the tank was quite complicated since the recoil forces were very strong and the recoil also needed a long brake path. The barrel had to be shortened by 130 millimeter, that is the length needed for the muzzle brake. The muzzle velocity reduced by one up to 2% by these measurements. So in the end, the new tank had a 122 millimeter gun with a caliber length of roughly 45. Note that some of the existing IS-1s were reissued with the 120 millimeter gun as well. The fact that the IS-1 and the IS-2 were extremely similar is also reflected by the fact that there is one manual for both of them. Big thank you here to Peter from Tank Archives. Be sure to check out his channel for helping me with transcribing and doing the translation. The heavy tank is a tracked fighting vehicle with a rotating turret. The tank is crewed by four people. The tank is armed with either 85mm or 122mm tank gun and three DT machine guns. Let us look at the IS-2 and some of its technical details. Now be aware this IS-2 served in the German National People Army, yet it was produced in the Second World War and is a model 1944. What is so interesting about the IS-2 is that it is still a massive tank. But when it comes to weight, it is rather light. The IS-2 weighs about 46 metric tons, the Panther A about 45, the Tiger 1 57 and the Königsieger a whooping 68 metric tons. Now if you look at the side profiles skate properly to each other, you notice that the IS-2 is not really that much smaller. Yet the IS-2 was about the same weight as the Panther, but had a strong armor and significantly bigger gun as well. So where was the weight saved? Well one reason is, we only see the side here, if we look at the width of the tanks, the situation changes a bit. The IS-2 had a width of 3.09 meters, the Panther 3.27 meters, the Tiger 1 of 3.56 meters and the Königsteiger of 3.76 meters. So the IS-2 was rather skinny, at least from the front. Yet there were other reasons as well. One aspect was how the armor was produced. Namely by casting it, instead of using rolled homogeneous armor plates. Casting gave the flexibility to make armor of various thicknesses and curves and by the virtue of later exposed less exterior surface area for equivalent volume. 
but it also proved several inherent imperfections. Another was that the crew was only four men, with only the driver in the front, whereas most other tanks had a radio operator that usually was also the hull machine gunner. Now of course that one guy doesn't weigh that much, but you also need less space, hence the overall dimensions are reduced as well. Speaking of dimensions, a few words about ergonomics. Some sources note that the IS-2 was rather cramped. Although Saloga notes it was relatively spacious for a Soviet tank. The Soviets did not ignore ergonomics as some claim. The Object 240, the precursor of the IS-2 tank, was tested by the Soviet medical services. They pointed out various problems. These were fixed before the tank went into mass production. Of course, every country has different ergonomic standards. This becomes rather apparent if one looks at US and Soviet tank turrets from the Cold War. Let us take a short look at the role of the IS-2. Like the German Tigers, the IS-2s were organized in small independent units that were under the control of the high command. Usually they would be concentrated at important points. Due to the war situation, the Tigers were mostly used in the defensive role, for instance halting Soviet breakthroughs, whereas the IS-2 was often used to support such breakthroughs. The heavy tank is used during offensives against a heavily entrenched enemy. It is meant for destroying enemy personnel and weapons, and also for combat against his tanks and artillery. Although the IS-2 was influenced by the Tiger and there were certain similarities, there was also clear differences when it came to the roles of both vehicles. Also, unlike the German Tiger I, which was optimized for tank versus tank fighting, the IS-2 was intended to assist in the offensive operations in both breakthrough and exploitation phases. As previously mentioned, this is also reflected by the armor loadout of the IS-2. Let us take a short look at the armor. For this, we look at the 1944 armor layout, which is equivalent to the 1943 layout except for the frontal plate. Let us start with the turret. The front armor had a thickness of 100 mm, yet due to being rounded it had generally a higher effective armor thickness. Note that some sources give different values here, like 155 or 160. Yet the Russian author Mikhail Baryatinsky also notes 100 mm. Finally, the user Ami Sao on the Warfunder forum actually went out and measured various IS-2s and he noted that on the measured IS-2, the turret armor was around 100 mm. For the gun mantlet on the IS-2, Ami Sao measured a maximum thickness of around 115 mm. Although keep in mind it is curved so effective armor thickness is higher. Note, to give some contrast, I will show the values of the Königstiger as well. The upper glacis plate had a thickness of 100mm at an angle of 60 degree, as such an effective armor thickness of about 200mm. Note that some sources give an armor thickness of 120mm here. I assume this is due to the fact that the frontal armor plate could be either made of rolled or cast armor, whereas the latter had to be thicker according to some documents. The lower glazes plate had 100 mm at an angle of 30 degree, as such an effective armor thickness of 150 mm. The turret side armor had 90 mm at an angle of 20 degree, as such 96 mm. The hull side armor had also 90 mm at an angle of 15 degree, hence 93 mm of effective thickness. Note that early versions of the IS had a weakness in the frontal hull. The first battles of the IS-1 tank showed that the armor of new Soviet heavy tanks does not entirely meet the modern requirements for battle. On February 19, 1944, tanks of the 13th Guards Heavy Tank Regiment came under fire from Panther tanks. The front armor of the IS-1, built to withstand fire of the 80mm KVK-36, could be penetrated by the 75mm KVK-42. Two tanks burned up and three more were knocked out. One reason for this was poor casting quality, yet an engineer concluded that the main reason was the shape of the front hull. Most notably that an observation port for the driver weakened the front hull. This was solved in the 1944 model by changing the shape of the frontal armor plate and removing the port. As you can see this is an IS-2 model 1944. The driver has a vision slit, but not an observation port in the frontal armor plate. When it came to the armor layout, the IS-2 had the highest armor to weight ratio of contemporary Soviet tanks. The T-3485 had 35% of its weight consisting of armor. The KV-1S 39%, the KV-85 41.5% and for the IS-2 almost half of its weight was used for armor, namely 47%. This clearly underlines that protection was a key element 
in its design. Next is firepower. The 120mm gun of the IS-2 was a devastating weapon. Yet if one looks just at the armor penetration values, one might think otherwise. As so often, the devil lies in the details. Here you can see the approximate armor penetration values of the IS-2's gun versus the gun of the Königsdiger at a 30 degree angle. Yet the projectile of the IS-2 was rather heavy and had quite an explosive filler. Hence the Logan notes, in the rare cases where this was not sufficient to penetrate the armor, the force of the impact and explosion of the high explosive filler was usually enough to blow a turret of almost any tank. This is even more the case the longer the war went on, since German armor quality decreased due to the lack of certain ores and other problems, as such parts of the armor might break off or other substantial damage might occur. Yet we are not finished. The most serious disadvantage of the IS-2 was that its small internal size permitted storage of only 28 rounds of ammunition, and these were of the split type which slowed the rate of fire. This was in contrast to the 88mm of the Königsdiger, it could carry up to 86 rounds and the ammunition was one piece, so the projectile and propellant were unified in one cartridge. Meanwhile the IS-2 had two piece ammunition. As such the rate of fire of the IS-2 was very low. In his memoirs, Boris Petrovich Sakharov of the 15th Guards Tank Regiment, who was platoon and later company commander, noted, two rounds a minute at most. The loader had a hard job. First he had to load a shell weighing about 25 kilograms, push it in with a wooden loader, then take a shell casing, which also weighed 25 kilograms, shove it in. Of course it took a long time, but if you hit it, the target will certainly be destroyed if hit. As always with memoirs, take them with a grain of salt. Some sources know the fire rate of 4 to 6 shots per minute. The issue is, it is without doubt that the rate of fire of the IS-2 was rather low due to having two piece ammunition and one loader. Also, a previous report noted the 100mm gun had a rate of fire that was up to 3 times as high. Next is mobility. The IS-2 had a 520 horsepower engine and a combat weight of 46 metric tons. So a power to weight ratio of 11.3 horsepower per ton. The Königsdiger had 700 horsepower at maximum RPM, yet with a combat weight of 69.8 metric tons. This means 10 horsepower per ton. Yet interestingly enough, the Königsdiger had a higher maximum speed with 41.5 km per hour on the road and 19 km per hour cross country, while the IS-2 had 37 km per hour and 19 km per hour respectively. Not a huge difference and likely of little impact, yet a bit surprising. The IS-2 was better at climbing, whereas the Königsdiger was better at fording, while it is not surprising considering the rather low profile of the IS-2. The cross-country operational range of the IS-2 without external fuel tanks was about 120 km and with fuel tanks 185 km, whereas the Königsdiger had about 120 km. Since the maximum speed on the road is of very limited usefulness, the IS-2 with its better power to weight ratio was a bit better off. Time to take a short look at organization. As previously mentioned, there were similarities to the organization of the IS-2s and Tigers. Yet the closer one looks, the more differences become apparent. The IS-2s were organized in heavy tank regiments, which had an authorized strength of 21 IS-2 tanks by the February 1944 organization. Meanwhile, the Tigers and Königsdiger were organized in the heavy tank battalions, with an authorized strength of 45 cats, so more than double the size. This is a bit confusing if one considers that a regiment is one level above a battalion and as such usually consists of several battalions, yet the Soviets generally had tank units and formations that were rather small. Note that in December 1944 the Guards heavy tank brigades began forming, which consists of three heavy tank regiments. Finally, a short look at production. The first IS-2s came off the production lines at the end of 1943, which is quite early if one considers that the development started in February 1943. Let us look at the production numbers. These might surprise you, at least they surprised me. In total the Soviets built 3242 IS-2s during the Second World War. To put this in perspective, of the regular KV-1 they built 2874, of the KV-2 they built 232, and of the KV-1S, a total of 1,232. If we compare these numbers with German heavy tanks, there is even a starker contrast. Hölmann notes a total of 1,346 Tiger 1 
and the Mir 489 Königstieger. Of course, technically the Panther was also a heavy tank of which the Germans built almost 6000, namely 5984. We are aware that the numbers are not perfect, for the KV-1 production numbers only include the last 6 months in 1941, so the production for June is missing, although I doubt that the big picture is fundamentally changed by this inaccuracy. The KV-1 numbers are from Zaloga and Ness, whereas the IS-2 numbers are from Bayatinsky's book. To summarize, the Soviets were not happy with the heavy tank, the KV-1, and the modernization was not particularly successful. The introduction of the Tiger also stressed the necessity for a new heavy tank, and one with a gun that could defeat the Tiger at the proper range. The IS-2, unlike the Tiger, was not focused on anti-tank combat, as the standard ammo loadout suggests. For a heavy tank it was rather light, just being a bit heavier than the Panther tank, although it was not faster than a Königstiger. Well, I hope we learned something new. Thank you to Jens Wehner for the interview and helping with Russian quotes. Thank you to Peter from Tank Archives for helping with the transcription, translation and various questions. Thank you to the Military History Museum of the Bundeswehr in Dresden for inviting me in 2019. Thank you to Andrew for reviewing the script. Special thanks to all my supporters on Patreon and Subscribestar for making videos like this possible. Sources are listed in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.